So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the June 3rd Thursday Web Forum. Um, I'm Hillary Morris. I work on user support and communications for the South Atlantic Blueprint. And I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces on our participant list this morning. But in case we have some new people, I'll just remind you that we do host this web forum on the third Thursday of every month right here at 10 a.m. And it's intended to give folks like you a chance to ask questions, provide input, to help kind of chart our course for conservation here in the South Atlantic region. So I think this agenda will be familiar to most of you. We usually kick things off by introducing the speaker, then we'll have our main talk. Uh, we leave plenty of time for Q&A and discussion. And then I'll preview next month's webinar and share some updates from Blueprint staff. So I've already put us in silent mode this morning, um, but if you need to ask a question or a comment um, or give a comment at any time, you can just press star six to unmute your line or you can use the chat box and I'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the presentation. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to introducing our speaker, who's Brian Crawford. He's a postdoc with the University of Georgia in the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. And he's gonna be giving us a progress update today on a project that he spoke with us about a year ago. It's called the Longleaf Arc Project and it's focused on accelerating conservation of at-risk species in the longleaf ecosystem. So Brian, if you'll just hit star six to unmute your line, you're welcome to uh, take the power here and take us away. All right, thank you. All right, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the intro and um, yeah, thank you all for coming. We have a nice like kind of on the smaller size group this morning, which uh, is really, actually really love. Um, so if you guys have questions uh, throughout the talk, don't, don't like feel free to ask during the talk and not wait till the end. Um, I, I would definitely, you know, appreciate the the questions as they come and if anything's unclear just go for it um yeah thanks hillary and thanks for the the invite from the south atlantic lcc uh, i had a lot of fun doing this last year and i have a little bit of new stuff to present this year but i'll, I'll sort of go through the project um all the background and then some of the maybe exciting progress that we've done in the last year and get your opinions on it definitely want to hear uh, some of that and the ideas that you have on, uh, there's a lot left to do in this project. So there's a lot of time to talk to the experts like some of you all and um, get your feedback on what we can maybe do better at the, the local scale or the, the regional scale to benefit the conservation of these species. So with that, let's just get started. Um, we have this is this is a huge project. It's much bigger than me. It's much bigger than the University of Georgia, the state of Georgia, you name it. Um, and this list of collaborators just keeps growing. I can't keep up with it. Um, but I definitely have to thank, uh, first of all, our funders for this project, the Fish and Wildlife Service and Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks LCC, uh, the friendly LCC to the west of the South Atlantic. Um, they're one of three that has helped us out with this project and been full partners in it. And then we've also gotten support from NRCS and the Southeast Climate Science Center. So it's really taking a village of conservation organizations to get this project going. And um, as you can see, we're trying to you know, make sure there's, there's benefits to everyone. This, this list of names, as I said, I can't keep up with it. We have so many people that have been really generous with their time, their expertise, and even their data, which is not an easy thing to be generous with. I definitely understand that. But... It's been a really, uh, you know, for me personally, it's been an amazing project for seeing collaboration in action. And uh, I know some of you on the call um, either are on this list or should be added to this list. Um, but just know that we have a lot of people to thank, um, and this list keeps growing. So if you want to contribute, if you think you have data or opinions that can contribute to the project, um, we're, we're all ears and we're open to sort of taking on anyone else. So keep that in mind as I talk about this stuff. All right. Well, at the core of this Longleaf Arc project, uh, which we sort of stole the arc from park of amphibian and reptile conservation, we really have one question at the core of it. Um, it's a pretty big question, though. Should a species be listed, and what can we do regardless? Now, this is being faced by the Fish and Wildlife Service right now. Um, the second part of this question, what can we do regardless, is you know the topic on, on everyone's mind um, at the, the regional LCC level, at the state level, at the local level. Um, we're all sort of just trying to figure out how can we do good for species that are maybe at risk right now. And 
this is anything but a simple question, right? So answering this question really involves answering so many other sub-questions. And through this project, we want to keep this central question sort of in, in our target area, but it involves answering as many of these other questions as we can ahead of time. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the progress we've, we've made answering some other questions like, you know, uh, what are demographic rates for the species? What, what habitat do they need to persist on the landscape? But just know it's all leading to hopefully answering this question the best we can. Should these species be listed and what can we do about it regardless? So to back up here, whoop, sorry, hold on. There we go. Um, to, I don't know why this is having trouble, but we have the southeast that you can kind of see for a second before this thing. There we go. We have the southeast where 300 or over 300 now species of wildlife uh, are up for listing currently under the Endangered Species Act. And several have been found, or several are sort of um, obligates or associated with the longleaf pine system, very uh, rare and at-risk system we have in the southeast. And for our project, even though there's, there's more than 300 species we could focus on, we wanted to narrow that down a bit and actually, you know, make some progress. Um, so we focused on five species of amphibians and reptiles that are associated with the longleaf system. And that, uh, those five are the gopher tortoise, gopher frog, striped newt, southern hognose snake, and Florida pine snake. And so these species right now mostly, you know, when, they're, when they do exist in a state have statewide protection. The tortoise has federal protection, but just in the western portion of the rain, range. But the rest of them, you know, sort of they have the statewide protection, but they, they're up for listing for being federally protected across their whole range. So, so much work has already been done um, and actively being done at the state level and the local level for these, these species. Um, so there's a lot of work being done at the state level. There's a lot of work being done at the regional level, like these different uh, three different LCCs we have that encompass the range of the longleaf in the south. Um, so we have all of this, but there's still, there's still overlap, or there's still um, the potential for uh, a species range like the gopher tortoise shown here, all these presence points for the gopher tortoise, they, they range across uh, different regions, different states, different boundaries that we've set up. You know, these animals don't care about the boundaries we've set up. So this is a chance to take a range-wide approach um, to conservation and conservation planning and really figure out what's happening across the range, make decisions across the range, um, and figure out how to, how to uh, conserve these species. So our overall goal is to inform these listing decisions for these five and answer the question of where and how do we invest our limited conservation resources. Um, so where are the priorities across the landscape uh, in the long wave system? Now this project began in late 2016. Here's our convoluted timeline, um, show you where we're at right now with the star here. But last year we made a lot of progress in getting, getting the pieces together, getting a, a really wide ranging network of partners together to buy into this project um, and gather data and other expert input that has helped us shape the first sort of analysis stage of this project. And those are the like first, we need to figure out what is good habitat and where is that good habitat located on the landscape. So a lot of last year and early this year has been focused on habitat suitability modeling. I'll talk about that today. We've also had a couple of in-person workshops with some of our stakeholders. Um, just had one last February at Sea Park uh, that I'll talk a little bit about what came out of that. And uh, in the immediate future, we have a gopher frog-centric workshop being done with the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in July, coming up real soon. So this habitat suitability modeling part that I'll talk, to you today, I'll talk about today is really geared towards informing a much bigger modeling framework. And, you know, in the end, we don't just need to know where good habitat is. We need to know what decisions we should make to best conserve these species all across the landscape. And so in the future, um, just to tell you right now, I'll come back to this at the end, but 
where we're heading with this project is a structured decision-making framework that Fish and Wildlife Service can use and individual state and other partners can use to, to really answer the question, if we have limited dollars, where and how should we put those on the landscape? And so we're going to um, do some of those decision workshops later this year or next year, and then bring those habitat models together with population models, figure out where species are growing or declining on the landscape and where the priorities are for putting resources, and in the end, um, you know, deliver information that is relevant to the list in these species and conservation management across their range. So that's sort of the big, you know, 10,000 foot overview of, of this project, where we've been, where we're going. So digging into it a little bit, we have what I call a pretty, you know, scientific approach to conservation modeling going on. And it really has two phases. So the first stage, we got all, like, using that that partner network, all these people doing so much work across the landscape, the first thing we did was gather data. And most of it was locality data. So where are these species found on the landscape? And that could be based on a couple different data sets, uh, maybe strategic monitoring data sets from states or even opportunistic citizen science data sets. We included everything. We gathered as much locality data as we could. And we took that to map where, is, where and what is good habitat across the landscape. And we wanted to look at where the current good habitat is and then how that might change in the future. So we're, we're interested in future scenarios of different threats acting on the landscape and also different management strategies. And so this part of the modeling process helps us predict habitat trends now and in the future. And then we had this opportunity to do a little bit more. We're really not just concerned about where's good habitat. We're concerned about, or we're more concerned about where our population is doing well and where are they at risk. So we, we will do this in the future, but we added um, a different data set to just that locality data. So specifically for the gopher frog, we have a lot of states and other partners that have gone out each year and recorded presence and absence at the same sites across years. And so that presence absence data we can use to not just predict where the best habitat is, but where the best uh, populations are. Now, in addition to that, for the gopher tortoise, a lot of work's been done for that species, and uh, most states have um, line transect distance surveys, so that's LTDS surveys, that are being done uh, across the, each state at specific sites. And that gives us even more data to, per, to actually estimate uh, population sizes. So we, we can map where the good habitat is and then overlay that with where populations are actually growing or declining based on that line transect data. And so ideally, what we're going to do is link those two things together. How a population is faring now and in the future is probably based on the quality of the habitat and the connectivity of the habitat and all those things that um, the LCC focuses on a lot. So we're going to develop these more integrated population models that we haven't got to yet. I'm going to focus mostly on the habitat models today, but that's sort of our, our science-based approach to conservation modeling in two parts or two phases of this project. And ultimately... It's all leading to one place, it's leading to decision-relevant information for our different partners. So we're going to answer the questions, what and where is, best, is the best habitat? Uh, how do the habitats and landscapes affect populations? So what are the links between this box, habitat trends, and actually like a population's trajectory in the future? And then what are those population trends overall um, now and in the future? So any questions on that sort of overview of our, our modeling approach? I'll, I'll get into more details about the habitat models in a second. But Yeah, if you have questions, just hit star six to unmute your line or feel free to type into the chat. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, I'm sorry, come backwards. Yeah, so that's, that's all the modeling stuff. But really, like I said from the beginning, this is a very partner-focused approach to making conservation decisions. 
And we we spent, you know, I would say a year and some change really gathering, like seeing who was doing what out there and bringing them into this project. Um, and we've had a lot of success, as this slide indicates. So these are all of our partners um, that have contributed data, time, energy, uh, met with us in workshops. And this isn't even a complete list, I don't think. As I said, it's hard to keep up. So we, we formed this network of partners who a lot of them, you know, most of them have already interacted with each other and maybe collaborated in some capacity. But this project was a chance to really bring everyone um, together under this one project specifically and sort of maybe formalize a lot of the collaborations that have been going on in the past. So we have um, this network of partners in place now, and it keeps growing. And then with that network of partners, we've I really um, use their expertise to to build the pieces that we're going to use to make these models. So those partners have helped us identify what data is out there, what habitat predictors we should be thinking about, what are our management options that we should be thinking about, and any other sort of expert input that um, is helpful for our modeling process. So it's really started with the partners who are, are the experts in the field. Um, they've informed how we've built these models. And that's really important because they're going to be the end users of these models. So we want to know as much as they want to give us ahead of time so that we can, one, build the best models possible to figure out where good habitat and good populations are, but also so there's an element of trust. So they know what went into the models, and hopefully that will lead to more trust in using what comes out of the models. It's very important, I think. So they've given us a lot of input through, uh, like I said, in-person workshops. We've done some online surveys. We've um, had conference calls and webinars before. So using any method we can across this range, um, you know, our partners come from Louisiana to North Carolina, so we can't always meet in person, but we've you know, had plenty of ways to get their input. And like I said, that's, that input has gone into these species status models, habitat models, population models. And uh, they've also given us input on what they care about. Like, what information do they need to make decisions? What are their objectives? What do they need to, to measure success? And how can those models really inform that? So they've, they've given us a lot of input on the front end and back end of this, this modeling box, which sometimes feels like a black box. But hopefully, by doing this, um, there's a little more transparency in what goes in and what comes out. So here's, here's some progress. Um, this is about 70,000 presence points um, of locations of our five species across the range. Um, this is all contributed by a lot of different data sources and partners. Like I said, we used um, you know, state agency data, other natural heritage program data. We also used HerpMapper, which I don't know if everyone's familiar with it, but it's, a, any, you know, it's like eBird or iNaturalist, but just for herps. And anyone in the world can find a species and take a picture and put it on Herp Mapper. And they actually have a staff, a couple of staff members at Herp Mapper that verify everything that comes in. So all those points are verified um, to species, and we can, you know, they're validated. So we we got access to that data set too, and have used that opportunistic citing data set as well just to really, you know, cover as much as we can the landscape of where these species are. So that's the, that's the presence points. Uh, then the next thing we did was get a data set of habitat predictors. So what attributes exist across the landscape that we can use to um, estimate habitat suitability? And we used the literature, but we also used expert input to get this list of habitat predictors. And the way we did that was we asked the question, all right, if you think of ideal habitat for the gopher tortoise, let's say, what are the measurable attributes on the landscape that make that habitat ideal? And so we did a survey and we got responses from, I think, a total of about 30 experts um, varied by species. And we got this list of habitat predictors that they thought were important um, for the species like habitat. And what we did was sort of use this to prioritize what data sets we could get our hands on um, and added as many of these 
habitat predictors into our habitat suitability models as possible. We also got um, this type of expert input. So we know there's a lot of issues when you're doing species distribution models. You're sort of limited by um, presence points and where those presence points have been collected. As a, as a state or as sort of just conservation organizations in general, we're not great at reporting when we don't find a species. So what we wanted to do was add to those, those presence points um, and inform where we should put what's called pseudo-absence points. So we wanted to tap into the on-the-ground knowledge of our experts we gave them a Google Earth exercise where they circled places where maybe they've been, but they didn't find anything and didn't write it down. So they've circled maybe this magenta areas, like they've been to these three sites um, and haven't found the species there. So that's our, you know, expert absence area. And then this, uh, this cyan-colored polygon down here might be an area that they haven't been to yet but they suspect that species are likely there. So that's our expert presence areas. And we did this before we modeled anything. And what we're going to do is compare what the model predicts to um, these expert areas. So maybe if they haven't been to this area but think it might be suitable, how suitable is that habitat according to our predictive model? We can answer questions like that. So a couple different types of expert input we've done. Now getting into the actual habitat suitability modeling across the ranges of these species. Um, these, the ranges of all these species are, are pretty wide, and we, we understand from our experts that things are different from one place to the next. So we use these ecoregions shown here in different colors to allow like what good habitat is to be different, say, down here in the Gulf versus up here in the Sand Hills. So we included these ecoregion blocks in our models to just allow that, you know, good habitat isn't the same everywhere. Good habitat might have different attributes down here versus up here. So we use those ecoregions um, and other expert-informed divides um, to sort of block the landscape out. And we also did this. So based on different species, um, we tested different scales of these predictors. Like what, what is important for a gopher tortoise? Is it what the landscape looks like in a 30 meter, 30 meter radius around its burrow? Or does it matter more what's happening on the landscape on a you know, 900 by 900 meter uh, area around its burrow? So we tested these different scales uh, relative to one another to see like, you know, things like canopy cover. Does the canopy cover have to be you know, a certain way in the immediate vicinity of the burrow, or does it matter more what the, the broader context of canopy cover is across, you know, uh, a bigger area? So we did that for several of the uh, predictor layers, like soil drainage, like how, how well drained the soil is around canopy cover, land cover, things like that. And we used uh, logistic regression. So we had multiple models with different sets of predictors in it, and we used um, model selection to figure out what the best model is to predict habitat suitability across the landscape. Now, in the end, what we, we got two very informative results here. So for each, so far, each of these three species, we haven't gotten to the amphibians quite yet, but I plan to do it next week. Uh, we have the gopher tortoise, southern hognose snake, and Florida pine snake. And one of the results we got was were the habitat species relationships. So how does habitat suitability on the y-axis change relative to different predictors? So here we have compatible land cover, um, which our experts defined what was compatible and what was incompatible for each species. And as you expect for most of the ecoregions, each ecoregion is in a different color here, so it looks a little crazy for some of these. But again, that just was done because we know good habitat isn't the same in one ecoregion or the next. But overall, we saw that as you have uh, more compatible land cover across the landscape, in general, your habitat suitability increases. That makes sense. We also saw that 
most of these species needed more well-drained sandy soil. Um, so there's a nice steady increase in um, habitat suitability as you got more well-drained and more sandy soil in the area. And then we also had a really nice um, relationship between habitat suitability and fire. And fire is a hugely important aspect of what makes good habitat for all these species in the longleaf. And what was really nice about this outcome is this, this, this relationship really mimics what the experts were thinking in general. So the common knowledge is you need a fire frequency of about one, um, you need to burn maybe every, every year one to three years. And so if you burn, uh, or, or sorry, one, two to four years, or one to, one to four years, I think is what people say. Um, so if you have a frequency of one out of four years, you're looking at about 25% here. And uh, if, or sorry, yeah, yeah, 20% here. And if you're looking at burning every other year, you're at about 50%, or sorry, 50% over here. And we saw just a really nice increase in habitat suitability as you go from never burning up until about burning every other year at the 50% mark here. So these results are, um, they're, they're mimicking what the experts thought and um, what the experts thought uh, was the case. So do we have a question? Yeah, I wanted to jump in, um, yeah. Brian, with a question from the chat box. Can you explain what TPI is and define that acronym? Yeah, definitely. So TPI is Topographic Position Index. And yeah, I wasn't going to go through all of these for the sake of time, but that's a good one. Um, so that all that means is what the relative elevation is of that spot relative to what's around it. So if you think of a sand hill, a sand hill is locally elevated relative to what's around it. So that would have a high topographic position index. Um, a valley would have a low topographic position index. Make sense? Cool. So we got these species habitat relationships, but you know maybe what what most people are concerned with is this result. And so these these habitat suitability models allowed us to map suitable habitat and categorize it by its different suitability classes across the landscape. And so this is the first version of the range-wide gopher tortoise habitat suitability map. And in red are the highest suitability areas. Blue is kind of lower. Um, if it's sort of gray, it's, it's just it's not suitable at all. And what these models were doing across the landscape were, were two really important things. First, they were highlighting a lot of the red area that we knew were like our strongholds for the species. So this is Eglin Air Force Base down here, this giant red thing. Um, that's that's a major site for, um, it's, it's a major site for where uh, tortoises are relocated to in Florida. Um, there's other things like the Jones Center popped out as bright red in Georgia, if you know where that is. There's a lot of other um, state or state forests, state um, wildlife management areas that popped out as red. So the, the model is predicting, it, it's assigning high suitability to the areas that we know are, are highly suitable. The other thing it's doing is it's not just saying those are the only areas that are highly suitable. So it's showing on this map, there's a lot of red uh, in little, little patches that we didn't have data for. So it's, it's not just overfit to where we have found these species already. It's showing other areas that even though we don't have any data, those might be, you know, those have all the attributes of good habitat and might be worth looking at either to monitor them, see if the species are there, or to, um, you know, if they're on private lands, maybe um, focus on some private landowner incentive programs there and uh, do different things like that. So that's really important um, that these models aren't overfit and just telling us what we already know. What they're telling us are maybe opportunities for conservation across the landscape in areas that we, we don't know anything about yet. So we really liked that outcome. If I could jump in here one more time with a question, Brian. Um, can yeah. you speak to the underlying resolution, the smallest pixel size of this map? Yeah, it's, uh, we, we did this at a 30 by 30 meter scale. 
So pretty, pretty fine. Um, yeah, yeah. We were in most of the predictor layers, except for the climate layers. We could get at a thirty by thirty meter scale. There's more fine scale data in Florida, but because the rest of the range is limited to the thirty meter scale, we sort of, um, yeah, leveraged up in the in a thirty by thirty meter raster. So these. It it's it gets down pretty fine, um, and yeah, it's it's looking. I mean, that's about these are big maps. These are these are um, a lot of yeah. It's a lot of computer space to develop these and keep all these data layers. But the resolution is going to be really informative um, when we give these results back to say state managers or site managers. Um, so we can zoom in and be really specific about where these predicted high suitability areas are. Yeah. So we did these we did these suitability maps for all three of these species so far. Like I said, we're working on the next two, but we can do things like overlap the three um, species suitability maps and see where you know where might priority areas be for all three. So again, this is Eglin Air Force Base, and it comes up as highly suitable for all three of these. So that's you know, if you put your conservation dollars on that, you're not only you shouldn't only benefit the gopher tortoise, but you should benefit the snakes as well. So we can use these overlays to also sort of think about how we make conservation decisions across the landscape. So that was I mentioned that was the first round of these habitat suitability models. And nothing's ever perfect. And that one was looking pretty good. It was, you know, like I said, it was sort of um, showing a lot of what the experts believed to be true to begin with. So it was doing some things right. But what we did was we took this map, printed it out really big, and took it to an in-person workshop with our experts and said, all right, write all over it. Tell us what's good, what's bad, what's working, what's not, um, and how we can improve it for the future. And... They didn't hold back. So this is some of the stuff that we got, uh, more or less. They circled some areas and said, that is not even close. Like, there's way more, there should be way more suitable habitat out here in Georgia, for example. Or this is way over predicting suitability. There's nothing around there that's good. Um, down in South Florida, like, oh, that's, you know, it's, it's too wet down there. They don't live down there. We got a lot of great feedback. And what we did was use that to develop some new predictors that went into the model, like historical disturbed land cover. Um, that was a really interesting thing that came out of some of these discussions. Uh, habitat suitability currently is not just a product of current land use, but also past land use. That's something we hadn't considered before, but um, used some expert feedback to get that into the model. We had additional fire layers that we got in. Um, and we also use this expert input to sort of uh, model, like, the periphery of the range a little bit differently than the core. Because we, we noticed the model was performing less well in so South Florida, up in the Sand Hills, and then to the west. And that was all based on expert input. So what we did was took that expert input, used some new predicted layers, modeled it slightly differently, and this is the version 2.0. And this is as of last week I made this map. So we have a couple things that kind of changed. A lot of it um, sort of zeroed in to places and, and got a little more specific about where the best habitat was. And a lot of that, there's a lot of blue area in the last map, especially like over here in the west and down here. And you see a lot of that kind of vanished. Um, so this map might be a little more focused on certain areas. And, um, yeah, it might be a little less inclusive of stuff that could, that was classified as suitable, but might not be. So with that, we can start thinking, even if we just ended right now with these habitat models, it's really good information to inform conservation planning. So we can use these layers, and this sort of gets at your how, what's the resolution here, and this, we zoom in and Again, these are on a, each pixel is a 30 by 30 meter spot of land. Um, we can zoom into different areas and ask like, all right, well, what is our priority? Should we just focus on areas like this that um, have tortoises present, for example, and are high suitability? 
Or what about this area that, you know, maybe we found one there a long time ago, but it's just a really big area with a lot of habitat predicted to be really high, highly suitable. Um, or should we rather invest our, our uh, dollars into an area that has tortoises but is less suitable? So we can, we can take these to our experts and our state managers and really um, ask some of these questions. We can look at um, site protection status and connectivity. So in this map, uh, the blue areas are protected, the red are not, and the dark red and the dark blue are the areas of highest suitability. So uh, we could think about, you know, well, maybe if we preserve, if we you know, take this little corridor right here that's between two protected areas and um, acquire it for the state, that might be a good use of funds because it'll, you know, act as a corridor. Um, some of the habitat is less than highly suitable, but the benefits of connecting these two patches might outweigh the lower suitability. Um, so we can ask questions like that, or like I said before, we can overlay maps and ask, all right, if we wanted to do the most good for all five of these species or all three of these at this point, um, you know, maybe right here where all three overlap in highly suitable habitat, that might be the best place to put our conservation dollars. So these are the things that we're starting to think about right now. Um, and they're the things that, uh, that other groups are already thinking about. There's a huge grant. Um, I think the focus of this grant was on black bears, not on amphibians and reptiles, uh, but yeah, there, there's something within the last year in North Florida that outlined this whole area um, between the Ocala and Osceola National Forest, and they're looking to connect as much of this area as possible. And so we have the maps that can show where those connections might be best suited um, to benefit these species. So um, yeah, there's just a lot of other sort of conservation planning activities going on right now that um, this this type of information can inform. So again, this, this all tells us where habitat is. We're, we're not making decisions about habitat. We're making decisions about species, or we need to make decisions about species. So how, so we can, we can do a pretty good job modeling the habitat. What about the populations and these species? So that's where we're at right now. We're, we're doing two things. First, we're trying to figure out um, how to project habitat and populations into the future under different threat and management scenarios. Um, that's also an important question that the Fish and Wildlife Service wants to answer when they do their species status assessments and make listing decisions. And then we're also trying to link habitat features to actual population demographics. So if you have a place that, that you increase the habitat quality, for example, through different management, how is that going to affect the population of tortoises that live there or so, or so forth? So we got together, and this will be kind of brief about, but because it's still very much uh, in the process of, of being worked on, but in that uh, last workshop that we had with our stakeholders, we got together and we talked about these connections between habitat and populations. So we talked about what are the main drivers and threats that are impacting habitat and species now and in the future? Uh, how does habitat impact species demographics? What are some management strategies that we should think about? And then we also talked about um, sort of our objectives, and, and this will lead to the bigger decision-making frameworks that we'll, we'll come up with uh, in future work. So what we did was we, we got together and we built a conceptual model of how an upland longleaf pine system operates. And in this, uh, the, it looks complicated now, just wait, it's going to get more complicated, but there's a lot of factors that influence, you know, what goes into being good habitat in the longleaf system. Um, so in general, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but the red boxes are threats. The green are um, ecological factors or climatic factors, climates down here, and the blue are demographics or, or sort of population factors. And so we were sort of concerned at what, what threats and ecological factors contribute to habitat suitability, and then this 
this vague arrow here, what are the links between habitat suitability or quantity or connectivity and uh, species demographics? So we, we asked them, we asked our, our experts to start drawing on this, add all their ideas about what makes good habitat, how these different things are related to each other, and they start off slow. You know, they were, they were a little bashful at first and maybe added a few things, but we got them going, kept asking questions, and by the end, this is our best representation of what a long-leaf pine system is. Now, this part was all about getting ideas on the page. Obviously, all these things probably do matter. We can't possibly model all these things, and some are, are probably more important than others. But it's a really good exercise as a group to figure out, like, you know, just all the, all the different things that affect everything else in the system and what we need to maybe prioritize and put into our population models. So in the end, this is what we came up with. Um, it's a little bit, you know, obviously it's, it's less complicated than the original con conceptual model, but it's still pretty complicated. But really, it just breaks down into two two different things. One is things that lead to habitat suitability, which we've already started modeling. Um, and the next is, is a lot of connections between habitat suitability, quantity, and connectivity, and different population metrics. This is where we still need a lot of work to do. Um, we need to figure out a, a better way to represent these connections. And um, that's sort of more for the future, but I just wanted to summarize some of the themes that came out of that workshop because I think it was really informative for us. So briefly, some of the threats that we talked about, fire, Fire is hugely important to this landscape, and um, fire exclusion is one of the main threats to habitat quality for them. Like I mentioned before, not just the current uh, land, land cover status, but the historical land use is really important. Um, some biotic threats like invasive non-native plants and other predators can affect species survival, and uh, especially recruitment, a lot of um, juvenile and uh, egg and hatchling stages of these species are affected by predators like hogs. And then also, of course, future climate has a, a big, uh, potentially a big Im impact on a lot of these species, especially when it comes to flood frequency, storm intensity. Just last year with all the hurricanes we've had in the, in the southeast, I know a couple populations of tortoises on uh, in southern Florida have sort of been completely washed out because of those storms, and we might expect that risk to just increase in the future. So for our future stuff, we're going to focus on climate and human development across the landscape. Now, in terms of this link here, habit, like linking you know, different habitat metrics to actually population outcomes, most rates, most population uh, outcomes our experts felt were really driven by non-fire maintained, you know, habitat quality. So if you have fire on the landscape, it really results in, in good all around habitat quality. And that influences recruitment, survival, carrying capacity, all these things that might go into our population models. The quality and most importantly, the connectivity of good sites, good habitat influences immigration, emigration. That's sort of an obvious one that we'll look at. Uh, and then other things like survival uh, might be affected by predators and disease. Disease was a topic of discussion. Um, we might not be able to model that quite as well. So in our current efforts, we're trying, like I said, we're, we're still in the process of trying to formalize relationships between habitat quality, quantity, and connectivity with demographics and population growth. So we we had a couple ways to do it, but in the end, what we are looking for is to develop these relationships. They can be uncertain. You know, we, they might just be guesses at this point. But in order to build a model that tells us the trajectories of these populations in the future, we need to link, we need to have some relationship between things like habitat suitability and carrying capacity, survival, that type of thing. Um, so we're going through the process now of getting our experts to answer some of these questions. Um, even if it's in a very rudimentary way, like say, imagine we have a site that has really high habitat suitability, 
what are the chances that the population is decreasing, stable, or increasing? That might be a place to start. Um, and for a lot of these species, we don't have good data or you know good estimates to fall back on. So we still think there's a lot of value in going through these steps and developing a population modeling framework, even if we're filling in the, the estimates with guesses, because the, we can just fill those in more as more data comes and um, more studies are done. But it is, you know, it, we're sort of taking the pragmatic approach of going forward with the best information we have possible, as long as we're being transparent about how accurate that information is. For management, we also discussed um, some of the management themes that they want to, that our experts want to see modeled in the future. So big effort right now in a lot of states is just making acquisitions to key sites. Um, Georgia, you know, I'm most familiar with that. They're acquiring a lot of new WMAs every year that have a lot of these high priority species on them. So things like our habitat suitability models can definitely help prioritize which properties should be purchased. Uh, but we're also looking at private, like a lot of private landowner incentive programs because in the East, just every state, no matter what, a lot of land is tied up in private land. So we can't possibly do a good job at conserving these species if we only focus on, on public and protected lands. So we have a couple other strategies that we can uh, think about, including you know maintaining habitat, restoring habitat, doing things like translocation of species. A lot of that's being done, and we're going to explore that in the future, maybe best sites for uh, receiving new populations or best sites for um, taking uh, individuals out of the population for a head starting program, and then uh, different predator management strategies as well. All this to say that this expert feedback has helped us develop these future threat and management scenarios that we're going to look at next and modeling how the habitat and how species distributions are going to change in the future based on these different scenarios. And that's going to inform our decision making. So in the, in the near future, we're going to link these habitat models with actual population models. Um, we're going to focus more on private lands um, and bring in some of our private land partners more formally um, to get their, their input on what can be done on private lands that maybe can't be done on public and vice versa. And then in the end, the, the, like I said, the remainder of this year, we're going to do this go for frog focused decision workshop very soon. And then we're going to replicate that with all four of the, the other four species, um, hopefully this year, maybe early next year, and continue to develop these decision models that will help our partners inform where and how they can manage. In the end, this project is going to answer the question, how viable are these species now in the future? And that's going to inform the listing decisions of the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And then also, we're going to, um, some of these outcomes are definitely going to allow for more strategic conservation actions at the local, statewide, and regional level. Um, so we're very excited about both of those outcomes. And with that, uh, that's all I have for you, but I'd love to hear your input, questions, things that weren't clear. Um, but yeah, thank you all for listening, and I'll take any questions at this time. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. So I'm going to take us out of silent mode so we can have a little bit more of a conversation. Um, the conference is now in talk mode. So uh, no more star six. I just ask you to please be uh, careful with the mute button on your phone so we don't get background noise. So does anyone have any questions for Brian that you didn't have a chance to ask during the talk? We have plenty of time. So I can ask a question. This is Virginia Dale. Hey. Um, hey there. This was a really nice presentation, and I'm quite impressed by your work. Um, oh. Thank you for doing this. Thanks. Thank um, you. So the question I have, um, knowing that fire is so important, yet there are places where it's not really possible to burn, mm. I wonder mm -hmm. if thinning as an option has been considered as a management plan. Yeah, great, great question. So. It, it definitely has. It's being used. Um, let's see. I wonder if that was one. 
I did not see it mentioned on the slides, but maybe I missed it. Well, yeah, I kind of I kind of brush over, but yes, thinning thinning and other sort of mechanical removal is being done. Um, really, your question is great because it, it taps into something like like you said, fire is not always possible on the landscape, and we talked about you know thinking about the future and future land use change and future development across the landscape. And as urban areas increase, one thing we're interested in is how is that going to constrain where you can put fire on the landscape? Because there's sort of this halo effect of if an area becomes developed, you need a buffer between that area and your, you know, wherever site you want to do fire on. So there's, there's a really good interaction or there's a really interesting interaction that we might try and model, whereas like having having maps of that show where future development is across the landscape how is that going to affect exactly what you said where you can or can't put fire on the landscape and then where you would need to do other options like mechanically remove hardwood and stuff but you're right like i don't know i mean i bet if you if you ask some of our experts especially some of the fire experts um i would think that there is no there's no full substitute for fire. I, I bet that would be their answer. I could be wrong. Um, but there are ways you can start to restore the habitat by by thinning and doing mechanical removal, um, using herbicide, things like that, um, that maybe that might lessen your need for fire or at least lessen the, the frequency that you need to use fire. But, yeah, it's a good question. And it's it's really interesting how... Yeah, future development might restrict our ability to to put fire on the landscape. Okay, thanks. I'm asking because of uh, the options for using this removed wood for pellets, you know, which is a growing industry in this area, and mm -hmm. concerns about pellet impacts when actually in this kind of situation there may be benefits if care is taken. Yeah, yeah, no, there's definitely, there's a lot of compatible ways there's a lot of work being done on compatible forestry practices that also benefit these species. Um, I am not, I had a question about this yesterday by somebody and I, I'm not as much of an expert on it as I probably should be at this point, but yeah, like a lot of the private lands programs we have going on, um, like the working lands for wildlife program by the NRCS seeks to sort of promote those compatible land use practices, like maybe using, like thinning and using some of the wood for pellets that result in landowners, um, you know, result in financial gain for the landowners. Like we don't want to, we, we hopefully want conservation to be compatible with some sort of financial gain for them. Um, but there are things that they can do responsibly. And then there are other practices that are probably incompatible. So I'm not sure where that one specifically falls, but yeah, there's, there's certainly compatible practices out there. All right, great question, Virginia. Anybody else yeah. want to jump in? Um, I'll ask. This is this is Amy Knight in Florida. Um, I really liked your presentation, Brian. It was great. Um, it's amazing how much thought and work went into all of that. So I really appreciate it. Um, my question is really just if if you could say a little bit more about the fire data that you used for the predictions. And I think I saw after your one round of expert review that that was one of the variables that changed somewhat, and I just would like to hear more about that. Yeah, definitely. So getting into this project, I, I didn't realize how many different fire layers there were. Um, there's all these different remotely sensed fire layer data out there, um, and as far as I can tell, none of them are perfect. Uh, it seems like everyone that I find I get really excited about, and then some experts like, oh, yeah, but that's that doesn't work here or something. Um, I don't know if that's been your, your experience, but certainly been mine. Um, but again, we have to take a pragmatic approach. We, we're not going to have perfect data, but we might have useful data. So the original fire layers that I used were actually a combination of two. So a little, might take a little explaining, but uh, I used the land fire data set of disturbed areas, and that tells you if an area has been burned at least once in the last 10 years. So you, can only, you can't get a, a real frequency out of that other than at, it's at least 
you know, one out of every 10 years. So I used that land fire data, but then um, I found the NASA MODIS fire data. Uh, I forget the formal name of that data set, but that tells that that's a, a layer of points that you can download for each year from 2000 to 2016. And what it shows, it, it basically shows an area of, I, I forget the area size, it shows where fires of at least one hectare or maybe it's 100 hectares in size uh, are were detected on the landscape. And what I did, uh, following the guidance of, of another study, is I took those points, those point layers each year that tell you where fire is, and I created a buffer around that to roughly depict the area that that fire was detected in, and then overlaid those 16 years, the 16 layers of fire, fire locations, and used that to calculate frequency. So drilling down to a specific pixel, how many years out of the 16 did that pixel, was that pixel burned or detected being burned from uh, the NASA data? So that's how I that's how I created a fire frequency layer, um, and then that actually that ended up performing better uh, than either of those two data sets independently, and it also performed better than the additional fire data we found after going through this revision process. So there's another one that came out: the burned areas, burned area extent. Um, layer that's from, oh wait, I have it right here, Burned Area Essential Climate Variable, B-A-E-C-V, is a USGS data set. And I found that after this workshop, and that, that was the additional fire data that I tested. Um, I think it goes back uh, 30, 30 years, and it's sort of a predicted layer of fire frequency. And that was that was the one where I was like really excited. It seemed like a great fire layer, and I downloaded it. And then actually, I think Rua um, of the SA LCC uh, gave me some feedback. Of like, yeah, it's actually it it's it's known to have some very big issues, especially in the southeast, especially in Longleaf, that we really needed it to perform well. And so I tested it anyway, and lo and behold, it didn't. It wasn't as good of a predictor as the original fire layer that we came up with. So the the NASA fire data ended up being the best. Wow, that's super interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks so, for explaining that. Yeah, no, it was a it was a very you know it's a good it's a good thing to dwell on because like like we said, fire is essential. Um, we know that, but it's also a really hard thing to capture through some of these remotely sensed layers. And um, yeah, we're sort of still on the lookout for better layers, but. I think we can sleep well at night, uh, even so far, because, like I said, the predictions that we were getting from that fire layer really mimicked uh, what the experts were finding, that you got a big increase in habitat suitability if you went from burning, you know, one out of every 10 years to one out of every two years. So the relationships were were reasonable, they were logical, and they agreed with the experts. So we can sort of hang our hat on that for now. Mm-hmm. That's great. A really good question. Um, thanks, y'all, for this good discussion. I'm going to whiz through a couple of additional slides just to let y'all know what to expect for next month's webinar um, and to give a couple or one quick update um, from staff. But we can pause again in like two minutes um, to talk about more questions if, if uh, Brian doesn't mind hanging out a little bit longer. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. hold anyone too far after 11. So, um, you get my sharing back up here. So um, here's what our next web forum is going to be about. It's going to be on July 19th, same time, uh, same connection information. It's uh, Ru and I are going to be giving this talk. Um, you might have tuned into our presentation a couple of months ago about how to use the blueprint to support your proposals for funding. And this is kind of building on that. Um, in addition to bringing in grant funds, the blueprint has also helped lots of different conservation organizations inform their decision making you know, fulfill policy requirements, prioritize their work. So we're going to get more into that side of how you can influence, you know, the condition of the ecosystems in the South Atlantic using the blueprint. So you might have heard some of these examples before. 
with like the NIFWIF using the blueprint to assess fish and wildlife habitat, um, or the South Carolina chapter of the Nature Conservancy has used the blueprint to update their statewide conservation vision. We're going to share those examples of more and really get down into more detail. Um, our main update uh, from staff in the South Atlantic is that uh, Louise Vaughn has rejoined our staff to help with user support. So she was a part of our team for several years. Um, she was gone on maternity leave and then working for about a year at a tech startup, and we're so happy to have her back on our team. So um, she is a resource for you if you would like to use the blueprint um, in your work. Other than that, not too many updates to share. We've really had our heads down working on uh, some supporting some blueprint users. Some of the things that we've been working on are um, the land protection plan for Mountain Bogs National Wildlife Refuge, helping integrate the blueprint into that. And I've been reviewing some habitat cores of a conservation plan, comprehensive plan map, excuse me, for a town in South Carolina. I always end on this slide about how folks can get more involved uh, in their cooperative. So um, you can join our website, connect with staff, explore the blueprint online. And with that, um, I'll open it back up for questions. If anyone has more questions for Brian or questions for me. I'll just say thank you all again for listening. And uh, like I said, if you if you have any ideas or ways you might think you could contribute to this effort. It is certainly ongoing. I should have said we, we just got about two more years of funding to do all of that decision-making stuff. Um, it does take some time, but there's plenty of time, plenty of opportunities. Um, so yeah, just, you know, I'm glad you're now sort of aware if you weren't of what, what we're doing. And if you ever feel like you might have an idea that would help us. Uh, we're, we're all ears. So my email, again, is B, as in Brian, Crawford, without the D, at uga.edu. Awesome. Thanks. And maybe um, I can work with you, Brian, to promote those opportunities to get involved in this project through our newsletter or on our website if um, you're looking for people to, to continue to join in and participate. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for coming. I um, hope to see you guys next month. Thanks again, Brian, for your great presentation. Um, You're welcome. All right. Everyone great. have a great rest of your week and great weekend. All right. Bye, thanks. Bye. Thank you.